Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Friday Forecast. I'm Robert Phoenix. Very enthusiastic today. Love the energy. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I do the best I can. Oh, please, no, thank you. I do the best I can here. Five days a week, six if you count the uh, the live stream over on YouTube. That's a lot of content. So what are we talking about? Uh, five times roughly a half an hour. So it's uh, two and a half, about four, maybe five to six hours a week that uh, I'm dipping into whatever I can bring to the table here for you. And, you know, look, let me just get this on, on the... Uh, on the front burner. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm a human. I make mistakes. I make errors. I learn. I grow. Not perfect. And uh, there are some folks over on YouTube that uh, like to remind me of that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Whether it's whether I make a mistake uh, about... Uh, Content. I have to clarify it. Not perfect. Or uh, I have to kind of look at my own pieces and tweaks. Not perfect. But we can have a dialogue about it, and uh, dialogue we shall. And right now, let's get into it. It is the 21st of April. We are now at the sign of Taurus up here in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Of course, it's Taurus in the Southern Hemisphere as well. Although, who knows? Maybe we can just split it up. And <clears throat> in the Southern Hemisphere, maybe really this should be Scorpio, since it's like their fall, and we have Taurus. But alas, that's not the case. So zero degrees Taurus, and uh, the third degree of Taurus, which will be let's see, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, is considered one of the most prime degrees of the zodiac. That's on Monday, and apparently because it's a conjunct Sirius. Sirius is at 33 degrees. Taurus, this is what I've been told. Although I, I could be I could be wrong. I could be making another mistake. You can correct me on that. Um, the energy today is very quiet. Something is in the air. Something is in the air. It's like the calm before the storm. Can you feel it? You kind of feel into it. We had another shooting yesterday in Paris. Two police officers shot. One dead, one wounded, one man under arrest. Did it happen? As we get closer and closer to the French election, and I do not think Marine Le Pen is going to win. I think that the Brexit and the Trump skit, the Trump skit. Um, I think that I think that role is kind of slowing a little bit. I think they've kind of figured out how to uh, stem the tide of the nationalist fervor. And really the nationalist fervor is the individual fervor. That's really what it's about. It's about people being allowed to make choices in their lives apart from some kind of overarching oligarchy plutocracy, even a democracy that reaches way too far in a republic that has forgotten that it's actually a republic. That's really what it's about. It's about the individual. The individual being able to self-determine. And uh, globalism shakes its head at that, says, no, you're not going to be self-determined. That groups are going to be Determining who self-determines in certain groups will be empowered and other groups will be disempowered. And through that, we'll have the Hegelian dialectic and 
because this is what's going to occur when you have groups that are literally at war with each other and there's this whole notion of forced diversity that there can be very little resolution because people generally are tribal and they want to hang out with who they want to hang out with. Now, that's not to say that we can't learn from one another. We can't have a rich experience understanding another person's life, whether they're an African-American or a Mexican-American or an Italian-American or a German-American or a Northern, Northern European-American. Filipino American. All the Americans have the ability to learn from each other. Um, but we're tribal. And we like to hang out with people that we like to hang out with. And that's the bottom line. And there really isn't anything wrong with that. But what happens is, is when groups are managed, and they're managed to the point where they're literally being pitted against one another, then we have a conflict. And we get into problem, reaction, solution. Now the conflict itself has not become even close to being heightened, although it's a little, a little heated. Getting a little more heated with each passing day. But it is uh, not quite there yet. It's getting close. Getting closer. And what will happen is when these groups become into more and more conflict, then ultimately a solution will be at hand because that's the way the Hegelian dialectic works. Problem, reaction, solution. So where is the problem? Well, really there is no problem. The problems themselves are manufactured. The problems themselves are, are created and then they're metastasized. In a healthy society, people are able to work, create, understand themselves, take pride in what they do, offer something up for society, art. See, it might even be practical. It could be art. It could be music. It could be food. It could be a piece of technology. But we're adding. We're adding to the overall structure and evolution of our story. And what, what's been happening is that addition process has been interrupted. Completely interrupted. You know, I've been listening to uh, Anthony Sutton again. He's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And he really gets into, this is back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s when he was doing a lot of, a lot of talking he really gets into the evolution of the former Soviet Union and how it happened. And the thing I love about Antony Sutton, and he reminded me of this today as we are in Mercury retrograde and having to deal with the words that we've said before, whether we were responsible for them or not, or they were intended under a different consequence series of consequences. Anyway, Sutton said, I only talk about what I know. I only talk about what I can prove. Because at that point, the information is unassailable. And when you begin to talk about things where there is not as much information as possible, then that's when you can lose your credibility. And it was a really good thing to hear from Sutton. Anyway, what he was talking about was how the Soviet Union, when it was started, of course, by Lev Bronstein uh, and uh, the bankers from Wall Street, and they brought all that gold bullion over to the Soviet Union, or at that time Russia, and they kicked in the Russian Revolution. Once there was a revolution, the, the USSR, the People's Republic, of Russia had to start creating things and they couldn't create anything. They really couldn't build a whole lot because they didn't have any money, they didn't have any infrastructure really, and their 
been a massive revolution going on, and Sutton talks about the involvement of the West, and the West built up the Soviet Union. It was through Wall Street and American industry and British industry that the Soviet Union was able to sustain itself, to stay alive. And even the uh, addition to the United States or the Soviet Union's grain stores, the United States kept them fed, made sure that the Soviet Union had lots of wheat. Now, communism could have been defeated very easily if they wanted to defeat communism, but that was never the plan. The plan was to enable it. But what Sutton said, what that was very interesting, is that under communism, you can't really create anything. Nothing new is really created because there's no incentivization. And he also said that what they could do, however, is they could replicate. So if they figured out how to build weapons based on American weaponry, uh, then they could replicate it. But nothing new would come out of a communist regime. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because this gets back to our story around creating and building and adding to the ongoing evolutionary process of novelty. So where are we with all that? It's an interesting, it's an interesting question. And it feels more and more like we're into uh, the destruction part of the creation-destruction cycle as we uh, parade around the world with our warships and our battleships. And maybe they're in North Korea, maybe they're not. Maybe they're in Australia, maybe they're not. I've had some, uh, I've had some people talk about from Australia and from New Zealand where they're seeing um, the ramp up of aircraft in ways they haven't seen before and serious aircraft flying in formation and you know Australia and New Zealand are not that far from the, you know, the Pacific front or the theater the war theater in the uh, South China Sea and the far Pacific so there's activity taking place and there's a very good chance we could have a war now, Kim Jong Un is, you know, let's let's get this on the table, okay? If Kim Jong Un decided he wanted to launch a missile at San Francisco, it would not take the United States very long to shoot it down. I mean, the missile defense system of this country, state of the art, one of the best in the world, and unless they decide to let the missiles go through, which is basically how. We all know that World War II was started with the, with the Japanese. We allowed Pearl Harbor to happen. Oh, good day. Let's go kick their ass. But they knew. They knew. They knew the Japanese were going to attack. I remember when I was a kid and I saw that movie Tora, Tora, Tora. It's a great movie. Like, just from the logistics and the battle scenes and the authenticity, it's it's a great movie. You know, and you're a kid and you're thinking, oh man, I've got to get those Japanese guys. And that's about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And of course, there were some heroes involved, but, you know, we took it on the chin. And the reason we took it on the chin and we lost a lot of men in the USS Arizona and the other ships were sunk was because it was supposedly a surprise attack, when really it wasn't. It wasn't a surprise attack at all. And I remember there's a scene in that movie where there were these two guys who had the information. They slipped it in there. They, they had the information that Japan was going to attack. And uh, according to the movie, nobody listened to them. Didn't get it through the right channel. And, of course, they attacked. And I remember seeing that as a kid and thinking, man, things in the world are not right. I don't know how old I was, maybe 12, 13, I don't know. But that was that was adding into my sort of conspiratorial consciousness at a very early age. So theoretically, they could let a missile slip through. Yeah. The next thing you know, we've got a pretext for war. But really, there's no way that they could actually fire a missile. You know, have you seen the video recently? 
where Kim Jong Un is, you know, got all of his generals and majors in the room, and there's a big speech, and they're all like loving it, right? And at the end, they play this uh, clip where this missile gets fired from North Korea and it crosses the ocean and it hits the west coast of the United States. And the United States is in flames, and you know, and everybody's like clapping and. <laughs> it's, it's kind of cheesy and really sort of amazing at the same time but it ain't happening right it, it really ain't happening unless they let it happen and they've created a bogeyman in Kim Jong-un and I've heard the most sort of sensible things coming out of people that are tuned into this, dialed into this, it's like, uh, why don't we just let them handle it? Why don't we just let the South Koreans handle it? Why don't we let the Japanese handle it? You know, let's sell the Japanese some weaponry and get the hell out of there. See, this is your problem. He's your neighbor. And you just send a message to Kim Jong-un and say, you know what, buddy, we're, we're out of here. We're out of your business. If you've got problems, you got issues, deal with these people. Wow, wouldn't that be an interesting concept? I mean, let's let's bring it down to the personal. Let's say there's somebody who's in conflict with another person, possibly. And all of a sudden you insert yourself into the conflict. And you say, well, you shouldn't be doing that. And you really have no business in that conflict at all. You ever happen to you? You ever insert yourself into somebody else's beef, and the next thing you know, it's, everything goes south. Everything goes south. I mean, unless, of course, you ask, and that's a whole different thing. May I insert myself into your beef, please? That sounds wrong. But, uh, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? And then they say, well, yes, if you insist, please insert yourself into our beef. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, we've got consent. Consent. You know, has there been any insertion? Has there been any, hey, Kim Young, you mind if we get involved here? No, I do mind. You know, get the fuck out, Yankee. Okay, I get it. No problem. The problem is, is that um, there are people in this world with vested interests that uh, want to flip that regime for a number of reasons. We've talked about them before. Syria, North Korea, now Iran's back on the map, and Rexy Tillerson's beating his chest. John McCain, all five foot nine of him, is beating his chest, and Lindsey Graham, all five foot six of him, is beating his chest. We've got to take on Iran. Uh, and then Cuba, I mean, those are the four countries that are not involved in, guess what? Yes, the central banking system, the IMF, the World Bank, they're not involved. You flip those regimes, you get them in, and it makes the Rothschilds very, very happy. And uh, our friends in the Middle East, they don't like them either. I've been reading some background info, you know, through APAC about how bad Korea is, North Korea is, we got to get rid of North Korea. You know, they're terrible, you know, it's like you know, all of a sudden APAC becomes the spiritual moral arbiter of how things should go down on the planet. What APAC says goes, and there was a boatload of money that came in to APAC and uh, sort of greased the wheels with a number of different congressmen and senators and just before Trump was about to shoot his wad, his tomahawk wad over in Syria. So the game, just in case you haven't figured that part of it out yet, is we get taxed. 
and uh, we send Israel huge sums of money every year. And that money uh, comes back through APAC and other groups that are associated with that country. And they're able to use that money to buy influence amongst American lawmakers. So our tax dollars are going to a country, and it comes back to our country, through that country, uh, influencing people supposedly representing our country, but really representing that country in order, to, in order to perform some sort of service for that country in which they're able to benefit either directly through more money or indirectly through position, placement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, great, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great business model if you can... If you can get it, highly recommend it if you can get it. But that's essentially how it works. Anyway, I've been reading some stuff. Apparently, North Korea is um, not very well liked. So when the countries aren't very well liked, what do we do? We're told to do something about it. You go do something about it. And of course, President Kushner is more than happy to do that. More than happy. Let's see, anything from the last couple days? We have uh, the Aaron Hernandez death. Apparently he had the number 316 written on his forehead. And 316 equals 19. And he died on the 19th. The, 19, uh, the 19th card in the Major Arcana is the sun. And it almost feels like that with these ritualized events, these uh, mass killings and all the things that we went over from Waco to the Branch Davidians, you know, all, all that good stuff from April 19th, um, that there's this inversion. And since it's the 19th part of the Major Arcana, we're talking about the sun, so this is the... I would say the uh, the creation of the black sun. So April nineteenth feels to me like it's the uh, veneration of the black sun, since it's the 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 sun card, the major arcana, and the the energy of that day. It's quite dark. So it's the veneration of the black sun, the day of the black sun. Uh, Tom Brady did not go to the White House. Good friend of the show, Darren Wilson. Or Darren Williams, rather. Uh, Dazzle, Dazzle Williams. He's been sending me stuff that uh, this is a real slap in the face for Kraft and Bill Belichick, and he'll be on his way out of New England. It's very interesting that Brady wasn't there. Maybe he was working on his next $200 cookbook. Anyway, he wasn't there, uh, and uh, but Gronkowski was. Gronkowski was. All right, let's uh, let's check out some headlines here, and see what's happening in the world. Let's see. The Syrian gas attack narrative continues to unravel. Of course, you won't hear about that in the mainstream media. What you will hear about, though, is the fact that they have turned on Julian Assange. So the limited hangout, the cutout of Assange, is over. Now, Assange is a very strange character, indeed. His roots, quite strange. He belonged to an unusual cult in Australia. And I wrote, uh, I wrote about this cult all the kids' hair were, were dyed blonde, and they had those like, sugar bowl haircuts, and apparently they were given psychedelics. And I wrote about this a long time ago, when Assange first came on the scene. And a woman who was at that community slash cult actually commented on the piece, and she told me that, uh, that Assange had left uh, before things got weird. 
This is what she told me. That he wasn't really there all that long, but he was there. But nonetheless, it's unusual, right? I mean, he had some you know, strange kind of upbringing. Anyway, that's just anecdotal evidence, I suppose, for now. And um, But what we do know is we do know that he is on the outs with the uh, Trump administration. Uh, let me just read this here. Uh, we got. Hold on. There's, there's a. There's a piece with uh, Assange. Let me find it. Um. Anyway, he decided to. Uh, he's so now. I think there are charges. Out on Assange. Let me see. I gotta get the right link. It's right here. Okay, here it is. Here it is. U.S. said reporting charges against Julian Assange. And this is from uh, the website uh, Mediate, uh, which tends to be on the left. It's kind of a lefty site. It says, uh, CNN is reporting tonight that U.S. officials are preparing charges to seek the arrest of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Now, they may already have him in custody. Um, but here we go. It's part of, the, part of the show. According to the report, this is the culmination of the years, years-long investigation into Assad that began during the Obama administration. Let's read this, shall we? During President Barack Obama's administration, Attorney General Eric Holder and officials at the Justice Department determined it would be difficult to bring charges against Assange because WikiLeaks wasn't alone in publishing documents stolen by Bradley, now Chelsea Manning. Several newspapers, including the New York Times, did as well. The investigation continued, but any possible charges were put on hold, according to U.S. officials involved. In the process, then, the U.S. view of WikiLeaks and Assange began to change after investigators found what they believe was proof that WikiLeaks played an active role, here it comes, in helping Edward Snowden, an NSA analyst, disclose a massive cache of classified documents. Well, first of all, you can't believe anything anymore. You can't. You can't. I know it sucks. You can't believe anything anymore. You have to really climb down some rabbit holes and find proof. And even then, sometimes the proof is not really proof. It's something there that's there to lead you astray. You know why? Because they know people are looking around for proof now. And you got to be careful. you got to be really careful. Because it can be quite easy to lose one's credibility unless you're careful. Anyway, they're saying that WikiLeaks played an active role in helping Edward Snowden. You'll recall that even though President Trump already said, I love WikiLeaks on the campaign trail, CIA Director Mike Pompeo said in public remarks that WikiLeaks acts like a non-state hostile intelligence service. Mike Pompeo's got power now. Watch out. Watch out. A Washington report from earlier today says that federal prosecutors are considering whether to bring in criminal charges against members of the WikiLeaks organization. Now, you may say to yourself, okay, they'll go get these guys. Assange, maybe they've got him already. Maybe he was a cutout, limited hang, CIA, you know, draining stuff into WikiLeaks, you know, or maybe the NS, whoever, right? Because nothing is really as it seems. And let's say, really, they do go after the girls that Assange has repetum over in uh, England and they bring them to the United States and they Ezra pound them or whatever. You may not think much of that because, well, it's just another, fill, you know, fill in the quotes, fill in the air quotes. But it means something. It means that the whole idea of being able to provide 
if indeed it is truly pristine, which I really doubt, but let's just pretend that it is, to provide a, what I would call, agnostic source, right? That it's not attached really to anything, but where people could anonymously dump cables, emails, so that this whole process of being a whistleblower, which is really associated with truth, can be enabled. Once they shut WikiLeaks down, whether it's unlimited hang or not, it'll be very difficult to have another WikiLeaks, whatever the equivalent is, because there's precedent. There's precedent. So this is actually kind of a, a big deal. And it's a Mercury retrograde, so we're seeing, of course, this reversal taking place with WikiLeaks. It doesn't surprise me one bit. Doesn't surprise me one bit, and they'll try. They, they'll try to get Snowden, and um, that you know Snowden could be, you know, and I don't think the Russians will give him up. So Snowden is one of these characters that could lead to an international event, possibly. But I'll tell you, if they wanted to get rid of Snowden, it would be easy. Trust me. It would be very easy. They've got particle beam weapons. Uh, they got all kinds of stuff. And unless he's living 24-7 in a Faraday cage, uh, he's susceptible. And they know where he is. They, they know where everybody is on the planet at any given time. Wouldn't take him very long to find him. Uh, here's more from the Assange piece. An attorney for Assange, not his real attorney or, or uh, long-time attorney, because that, that guy's dead. Uh, Washington Post, let's see, attorney for Assange responded, the fact of the matter is, however frustrating it might be to whoever looks bad when information is published. WikiLeaks is a publisher, and they're publishing truthful information that is in the public's interest. Not really. It is not in the public's interest. Not according to Mike Pompeo and the CIA. Because really, WikiLeaks is either part of the CIA, a limited hang, or their competitor of the CIA. In any case, it's time to shut it down. So there you go. The end of WikiLeaks. Now, possibly. Now, um, what's going on that's related to this is uh, what I talked about in the run-up to the election, and I said that the surveillance state would increase under Trump. How did I know that? Because he said it would. We need more information. We need better information. How does that translate? What does that translate into? It means we need, we need to keep our eyes on you all the freaking time. And that's what it means. So as a result of that, guess what they're doing? They're um, going to start to establish facial recognition at airports and TSA. That's coming, and Trump is uh, fast-tracking it. And we're going to have facial recognition software. We kind of already do, but we haven't seen anything yet. And what happens after facial rec rec recognition software becomes ubiquitous? I mean, the retinal scan, which is already like on computers, right? If you want to have like a really cool app on your Apple and your iPad, scans your retina because only, only your retina can open up ooze and that neat. So we go from the ubiquity of facial recognition, because it's coming. They'll, they'll bring it to TSA. They'll bring it to the airports. That's where it will get road tested. Everybody will get used to it. Just like everybody's getting used to walking through the security scanners, the back scanners. 
Now they're now you go to a football game, you gotta walk through those things. Some schools you gotta walk through them. And uh, at some point, unless the uh, unless they close, uh, malls will have them too. At some point, although they may just may shut the malls down. So once people get used to the facial recognition, it'll be kind of like, um, you know, you won't need an ID because your ID will be inside the system and it'll recognize your face automatically. And once people get used to that, it's like, oh, they do it at the airport. Instant tellers, done. Check out at the grocery market, done, facial recognition. And there are going to be companies that will profit off this handsomely. And uh, one of the reasons why Trump will do it is because he's going to be in business with these people, or at least Jared and Ivanka will, President Kushner. So that's on its way. It's coming to TSA. And... uh, the surveillance state is going to ramp up. All right, so this is what Julian Assange says counter to Mike Pompeo. Just in case you're thinking that he may have something to say, that he might actually still be alive outside of custody. That doesn't say anymore that he's at the Venezuelan embassy. Is that right? Venezuelan embassy? Is that what he is? says WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has again hit back at CIA director Mike Pompeo, accusing him of attacking WikiLeaks for publicity reasons and alleging that recent leaked documents show all sorts of illegal actions by the CIA. That's right, that's that Vault 7 stuff. Speaking on the Intercepted podcast with Jeremy Scahill of The Intercept, The Intercept started by, uh, what's his name, the guy who's Snowden's buddy. Uh, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange responded to Pompeo, who described the whistleblowing group as a non- hostile, non-state intelligence agent. That's what, that's what Pompeo says. Pompeo made the remarks last week at a Center for Strategic and International Studies event. He called Assange and his associates demons. They're demons. And said he and his ilk make common cause with dictators. He and his ilk. He and his demonic fraternity. They are conspiring with dictators to harm little children. Just, I'll tell you what. You just reverse everything these people say and you'll get the truth. That's the bottom line. Assange responded in comprehensive fashion in the podcast, accusing Pompeo of attacking him to get ahead of the publicity curve. In fact, the reason Pompeo is launching this attack is because he understands we are exposing in this series all sorts of illegal actions by the CIA. So he's trying to get ahead of the publicity curve and create a preemptive defense, Assange said. This is the second time in less than a week that Assange has taken aim at Pompeo over the WikiLeaks remarks on April 14th. The WikiLeaks founder tweeted, Call the non-state intelligence service today by the State Non-Intelligence Agency, which produced Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Iraq, Iran, and Pinochet. Touche. It's true. It's true. They did, they did all that. It's kind of amazing that nobody ever in the mainstream media ever talks about the fact that we created ISIS. That's our creation. Those are our guys. Nobody ever really talks about that. They don't want to. Uh, The interview touched on a range of different topics, including allegations that Assange had a personal vendetta against Hillary Clinton and aggressively targeted her during the 2016 U.S. presidential election. He refuted the claims and revealed that he has never met Hillary Clinton but speculated that he would have liked her personally if personality if he did, I think I'd probably like her in person. He said most good politicians are quite charismatic in person. In some ways, she's a bit like me. She's a bit wonkish 
and a bit awkward, so maybe we'd get along. You know, I have said that you know Hillary Clinton or whoever her clones are, whatever, um, actually has a very good sense of humor. I've, I've actually thought Hillary Clinton was very funny at times and had great comedic timing, although I didn't really like her personally. I thought she could be funny. I mean, there are comedians I don't like personally, but sometimes they're funny. It's hard. It's like it's like cognitive dissonance. Like you're laughing at somebody who you don't like. You're you know or you're laughing with them. You don't like them. It's like hmm, they're making me laugh, but I don't like them. Oh, how do I resolve that? Uh, Assange was also questioned on the details surrounding the publication of internal Democratic Party emails from Clinton's campaign, John Podesta, Chairman, Clinton's campaign, Chairman John Podesta during the campaign. He reaffirmed the stance that he does not, does not believe that WikiLeaks were given documents by the Russian government. That was Seth Rich. Seth Rich was the leaker. Seth Rich is dead. And they know it. And also, it would have published Republican National Committee emails if it received them. And I believe that. I believe that. It could just be all one big elaborate charade that Assange is no longer in the embassy. Ecuador? Ecuador, as far as it goes, it goes See, I don't have to get corrected now. I corrected myself. Real time. Somebody's on YouTube typing. It's a Venezuelan embassy. It's the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, anyway, this is this is what's happening. And at the end of the day, what will it mean? It will mean that there will be no tolerance for anything that resembles WikiLeaks moving into the future. Done. We're closing off the exits. They're closing off the exits. The whistleblowers, free speech, which is clearly being mutated, truncated, and recreated into, quote-unquote, hate speech. They'll take that away. They'll, they'll start to take away uh, access on YouTube. They're already doing that. Facebook is throttling. They're going through... Apparently, there's some deal where they're having to check all this information with fake news, running it through their fake news filters that it's clogging up the traffic on Facebook. Of course it is. Now, the interesting thing about humans is that uh, we're pretty inventive. And when somebody tells us, no, we can't do something, um, people sit around and stroke their chins and go, how can we do that? How can we change something? How can we uh, modify or do something that allows us to do the thing we're being told not to do, even though the thing we're being told not to do is probably in the best interest of a large number of people because they should really know about it? That's the nature of being a human. You know, we're, we're inventive. So if WikiLeaks should fall, and it might, and as a result of that, it puts a damper on any future versions of WikiLeaks. Limited hang or not, uh, people will figure it out. And there'll be some, uh, some different avenues to solicit the truth. And you never know, right? Let's, so let's say they go along and they do this thing and they arrest these people and make a big deal out of it. And they take us on, out of holding, and, you know, make a big deal out of that. Uh, they they could wind up creating something even worse. You know, this is what happens sometimes, you know. You use a certain pesticide on a bug, and about three generations later, you got a super bug. Those pesticides won't kill it. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, Bill, Bill Gates is talking about uh, how terrorists could weaponize smallpox. Weaponized smallpox. So apparently, I guess if you had a smallpox vaccination, those terrorists couldn't get to you. 
It's like I can just see the advertising now. You got you got a kid. Let's make it a girl. Boys are out of vogue. They're out of fashion. Make her girl, and uh, where do they get the smallpox vaccine? Is it in the arm? It's in the arm, right? So she's getting this smallpox vaccine, and she's flipping her middle finger, right? So she's got the needle in her arm. She's got her middle finger out, and it's like right there, right there, ISIS. This one's for you. Let's see, what would be the tagline for that? It would be, uh, screw terrorism. Screw terrorism. I'm vaccinated. Because they couldn't say, or, you know, or you know what? You just have the middle finger. You don't say anything. Because so that's like, F you, and then beneath it, I'm vaccinated against smallpox. There it is. There's your, there's your, there's your ad. There's the girl. Of course, she's she's not really completely feminine because that's not really in vogue today either. She looks a little like a guy. But you can tell she's still kind of a girl. You know what I mean? Because you you know you don't want it to be too andro because then you lose the kind of femininity thing. You know that's sort of the uh, the contrast between the femininity and the middle finger, right? So kind of on the femme side of Andro, and then the, the needle in the arm, middle finger, uh, which is, fuck you, I'm vaccinated against terrorism. I'm vaccinated against terrorism. Fuck you, I'm vaccinated against terrorism. There's your ad. Make it happen. Uh, here we go. All right, this is what I wanted to find earlier. This is about Trump fast-tracking facial recognition. It's on a website called The Verge. And it says here, let's see what we got. The new biometric exit system would track visa holders' faces as they leave the country. Okay, that's where it starts. Soon it would be hard for visa holders to board an international flight without submitting to a facial geometry scan. Customs and Border Protection began testing facial recognition systems at Dulles in 2015, and expanded the test to New York's JFK, and last year, last year, uh, face reading check-in kiosks will be appearing at Ottawa International Airport this spring. So our, our good Canadian friends, many of whom listen to this show, uh, coming to you, and British Airways is rolling out a similar system at London's Heathrow Airport, comparing faces captured at security screenings with a separate capture at the boarding gate. Now, a new project is poised to bring those same systems to every international airport in America. It's called uh, Biometric Exit. Biometric Exit. The project would use facial matching systems to identify every visa holder as they leave the country. Passengers would have their photos taken immediately before boarding to be matched up with passport style photos provided with the visa application. If there's no match in the system, it could be evidence. The visitor entered the country illegally. Man, that that's weird, right? I mean, look, you've got a piece, you've got a you've got a uh, card, right? You've got a visa, and you've got a passport. And there's a picture, and it's there, right? What happens if there's a computer malfunction? What happens if your biometric picture doesn't show up? Or let's just say it shows up as somebody different. You're screwed. The system is currently being tested on a single flight from Atlanta to Tokyo, but after being expedited by the Trump administration, it's expected to expand to more airports this summer, eventually rolling out to every international flight and border crossing in the U.S. U.S. Customs and Border Protection's Larry Panetta. Any relation to Leon? Of course. Who took over the airport portion of the project? Remember, I explained the advantages of facial recognition at the Border Security Expo last week. What do you think they do at the Border Security Expo for fun? Do you think they like take pictures of each other and kind of like biometrically blackmail each other after they've had like too many shots at Chili's and uh, wound up at the booby bar at uh, 1 a.m.? What do you think they do at those conferences for fun? 
We currently have everyone's photo, so we don't need to do any sort of enrollment. Hmm, they have everyone's photo? Okay. How about that? <laughs> That's interesting. We have access to the Department of State Records, so we have photos of U.S. citizens. If you're a U.S. citizen, they got your photo. We have visa photos. We have photos of people when they cross into the U.S. and their biometrics are captured to the DHS biometric database. Some form of biometric exit has been discussed for decades, but it's only recently that facial recognition emerged as the method of choice. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Let's see what it says here. Uh, Customs and Border Protection agents currently take photographs and fingerprints from every visa holder entering the country. But there are no similar measures to verify someone has left the country before their visa expires. Homeland Security estimates that roughly half a million visitors to the U.S. overstay their visas each year. But without a verifiable exit process, the government has no way to determine how many visitors are actually overstaying or who they are. They're probably Irish. Biometric exits would close that loop, giving CBP agents verifiable biometric proof that a given U.S. visitor has left the country. The most recent proposal was set in form motion by former DHS chief J. Jensen, about the name, J. Jensen, who planned for a rollout by the beginning of 2018, but President Trump has sped up that process making the program a central part of his aggressive border security policy. I wonder uh, who is behind it. Who's behind biometric exit? Let's see if we can find out. Let's see what we got here. Um, it's a pretty long piece. Um... Here we go. Facial recognition critics uh, have raised concerns over racial bias. American recognition systems are typically trained on data sets of mostly white subjects, which leads to higher error rates when scanning other races. Okay, so here's, here's where diversity and uh, equality needs to uh, come into the picture. An FBI study in 2012 found three popular U.S. algorithms were 5 to 10% less accurate scanning African-American faces. You would think that that might be a good thing for the African-American community, right? You know, like, like, see, I told you so, man, I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's, there's, there's like room for error in there. I think that's a good thing. Uh, with similar declines for women and younger subjects. Because young people change their faces, right? Women, um, they just get prettier as they, as they get older. That's what happens. So they have to have a cosmetic enhancement inside of the uh, software for women. Uh, okay, what else do we have? Uh, questions like these are particularly urgent. They're urgent. These are urgent questions. As the program grows, racing to meet President Trump's mandated 100-day check-in periods. 100 days later, to check in. Trump's eating his chocolate cake. It looks up. Where are we with this? Currently only in place for a single flight in Atlanta, the biometric exit system is expected to expand to other airports. Okay. Let's see if we can, in real time find out who is behind biometric exit. Let's just find out. Let's see if there's a company. Let's do a little, little Googling. It's Google around. Uh, company. Biometric exit. Let's see what be shrouded in secrecy. Oh, there's an Office of uh, Biometric Identity Management. Uh, let's see, Biometric Exit, the Biometric Update. Let's find out if this is it. 
Uh, Homeland Security targets 2018 for biometric exit at key U.S. airports. Bio, oh, it's at biometric.com. Uh, let's see what we have here. Brand focus. Boy, this, this is a gold mine here. We got facial re oh, biometric solutions. Uh, find and review biometric solutions and service providers. Okay, so here's some of the companies. We got Alexa, uh, HID, Blustor. Let me see. Let me see if that's who the companies are. Let me see here. Uh, let's see. We have O1 Systems, 3M Cogent Inc., 4G ID, uh, ABC Inc., Access. IS Accurate Biometrics, AccuSafe Solutions. Boy, there are a lot of them. Alexa. Uh, this is just the A's. Holy Moses. There, bio key, bio, bio IDT, bio, bio IT. Hmm. Bio enable technology. There's bio V I T and then there's bio ID. Don't get too confused. Um, BioLink, BioMaster, Biometics, Biometric DNA. Uh, lots of bios, Biomids, bio, Biomids IDs, Biometric, <laughs> Biometrics, BioRugged. That's interesting. Bio rugged. Uh, Bio slim desk. Biz easy. Okay. B and key. Biometric authentic authentication platform. B and key. Ah, there's Booz Allen. There's our friends Booz Allen Hamilton. That's the company that Edward Snowden used to work for. Booz Allen has the experience, knowledge, capabilities in the biometrics field, and technology, strategy, policy, research, standardization, rapid prototyping to, to deliver the most effective solutions for our clients. Capture innovative solutions, card core group. Boy, this goes on and on and on. There are a lot of people involved in biometrics. Descartes biometrics. I mean, they're like the biometrics Olympics or something like that. What do you think? Get these people involved. Dawn Seed. That's a strange name for biometrics. Dawn Seed. They offer biometric time and attendance software. Mm. And there's Easy Clocking. No, oh, Echo Time, Time and Attendance. Here we go. Biometric Time and Attendance. Echo. It's green. There's a green version of biometrics. You know, if everybody gets linked up to biometrics, we can defeat global warming. It's true. Think of all the paper IDs that'll be saved. E-Security to Go, LLC. Man, they just go on and on. Oh, here we go. IC Solutions. Oh, that's clever, isn't it? E-Y-E-Y-E -E, and then C. IC Solutions. Very clever. Then there's iLock. I verify. And there's face data, face forensics, face ID, SA, face banks, face first, face fi, face tech, finger check, fingerprint cards, finger scan, PTY, finger tech, Fortuna Infotech, and the list goes on and on and on. I'd say there's a future of biometrics. Maybe I should talk my son into this. Son, there's a big future in biometrics. That's where you should be thinking about employment. Because lately they've been hitting your curveball. Uh, Hitachi, there's a big one. ID3, identity chip. Ooh, identity chip. So somewhere in this list, which is quite, again, quite, I'm not even through the eyes yet. I'm still integrated biometrics. Uh, somewhere in this list is going to be somebody, Lakota Software. Interesting, Lakota Software. 
um, somebody is going to be part of this um, bio exit, biometric exit program. And they may have more than one person involved in this, or one group, obviously. Here's another company called Morpho. Morpho, MorphoTap, and Morpho Trust. Apparently, Morpho is kind of big. Um, Nuance Voice Biometrics. It's all here. Picasso. Ah, there's my favorite one. It's not Picasso, but Picasso. Market leading software which delivers complete, complete identity insurance of consumers engaged in mobile, online, or branch transactions. Our solutions support financial institutions, healthcare companies. Hmm. Let's click on their link, Picasso. The face of security. This is the future. We have tapped into the future here. Go check out that website. Not Picasso. What are their corporate values? Their corporate values. Uh, all right. Let's see. Customer focus. A consistent emphasis on an open and collaborative environment. Acknowledge our customers as individuals and incorporate their voice directly into product development. Boy. Isn't that groundbreaking? Drive long-term value through leveraging our acquired knowledge to help individual customers achieve their own desired outcomes. Drive innovation through partnerships. Understand our customers' individual values. Respond and deliver to our customers with relevance and speed. Make our partnerships personal. Integrity. Empower our employees through a value-based environment ensuring they develop the essential traits to excel in a collaborative culture, to foster creativity in communication, celebrate, celebrate strength in different backgrounds, earn trust and shared accountability, place a premium on openness. Hey, look, this isn't just a company. You work there, and you're going to get transformed. You're going to become a biometrically transformed ambassador for the biometric values of the new age. You know what would be great is if uh, these companies come out, you know, where it would be like a customer focus. Our customer focus is to give you the best product we can and make as much money as we possibly can and simulate the fact that we really care about you and care about your needs and care about your ongoing business to the point where we can close a deal and hopefully continue to have some kind of relationship with you so that somewhere down the line we can sell you more products. Right? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, it might be more, you know, honest in some degree instead of this drivel. Drive innovation through partnerships. You sit across from your partner. What, what, what if you said that to your, to your marriage partner? Hey, hey, let's innovate. Let's drive some innovation together. You know what I really want to hear? It's like, when, when all the biometric stuff comes down, they're going to spin this and they're going to say, hey, this is going to be really good because it's going to provide security. We're going to, you know, how safe it's going to be and how fast it's going to be. You're going to get, you're going to get the security and the, and the uh, a convenience buzz. Well, what they should really be saying is we're doing this because we want to track every place you want to go. And even if you don't want to go there, we're going to track that too. We're going to know your every move. And not only are we going to know your every move, but we're also going to know your behaviors based on where you are. We're going to read your face. We're not just going to read your face to remember who you are, but we're going to have about 57 variations, maybe 157 variations of your facial expressions 
so that we can understand what your what mood you're in at any given time as you cross one of our many screens that we have biometrically set up sometimes in public but not always and it'll be for your security and it'll be fun just think of all those selfies you've taken oh yeah where are those selfies uh huh. See what I'm saying? It's Paranoid Friday here at the Friday Firecast. Uh, who are their partners? I want to know who their partners are. Okay, so Picasso, who's committed to long term, mutually beneficial relationships through multiple levels of support and collaboration with our other partner organizations. Oh my God, this shit is drivel. I'm just sorry, I'm sorry it's drivel. The development of our partner network is predicated on the premise of excellence and client support, promulgating and influencing global strategies, strengthening the market position, extending the reach and fueling continued growth for all participating parties. You know, it's like, did they talk like this to each other when they meet each other? Hi, Jim. This is uh, Gary from Picasso. Just wanted to check in. I wanted to... Uh, you know, see where we are with our partner collaboration. Yeah, because we want to be just mutually beneficial for you. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, you're you're beneficial for us because um, you've got money. you got people on your side of your organization want to spend it and want to look good. Okay, so you're going to be beneficial. We're going to be beneficial to you because we're going to create something that's going to make you look really good. And the people above you look really good. So you go to that shareholders meeting, you can whip this thing out, and you say, we got a relationship with Paycaso. And they're mutually beneficial. So their partners are PwC, Datastacks, Salesforce, hello, the Biometrics Institute, FIDO Alliance member, and the Medical Identity Fraud Alliance. What is FIDOalliance.org? Just click through the matrix here. Let's see what this is. Simpler, stronger authentication. FIDO is the world's largest ecosystem for standards-based interoperable authentication. Wow. See, I was thinking it was something about dogs. Like it was like some kind of pet biometric. I already know what that is. It's pet biometric. It's not FIDO though. Oh, uh, boy. So, adoption, market solutions, enterprise, telecom, government, healthcare, authentication, authentication, authentication. It's a Picasso partner. That's our future, boys and girls. It's coming. It is coming, and it is coming quickly. And all it will take will be one major event. And... Uh, We'll have the next level, next layer of security, which is already there, and just waiting, just waiting to get rolled out. Uh, yeah. The sounds you hear are me adjusting the lower left lumbar of my compressed disc. If anybody has any uh, Valium out there and you want to make a, a donation to the show instead of uh, money, which keeps this show alive, please send it along. I'd be happy to accept it. So we have this thing that I talked about yesterday. It's, uh, it was the op operation. Let me see if I can find it. I want to keep the news cycle alive. Um, operation Gotham Shield. Got a link up on um, Facebook. And I have uh, five likes and four shares. How about that? Five likes and four shares. And it's it's a video, and it talks extensively about what's happening from the 18th of May, which was three days ago, through May 5th. So nothing could happen. A lot of times nothing happens with these events. Nothing happens. They work a few things out. They do a little here, they do a little there, and then they go reconvene somewhere else, and they do that and that and that. And one of these days, though, sometimes these things do happen. Sometimes they go live, and it's quite, uh, I think, important to track these things and make sure that uh, that they don't go that they don't go sideways. You know what I'm saying? 
Uh, Ole Damagard does a great job of that. He he's I like that guy, man. I respect the hell out of Ole Damagard. Clear thinker goes to these events. He go, he's probably in Paris right now, trying to figure out what happened with that shooting, and he's got kind of a network where people are tracking these events and doing their very best to kind of witness what's going on as to whether they're actually real or not, because we're getting hip to the trip, you know what I'm saying? That's right. That's what I'm talking about. You're listening to the Friday Forecast. I'm uh, Robert Phoenix, and we're here in Mercury Retrograde. Kind of an interesting Mercury Retrograde thing coming into sports. Marshawn Lynch returning to the National Football League. I'm sure a lot of you people out there say, who gives a flying little finger? But just from a Mercury retrograde standpoint, it's kind of interesting. He's coming back to football. The beast is back. He'll be the beast by the bay. Because he'll be playing for the silver and black. Maybe Skittles can come out with a special silver and black edition of Skittles because Marshawn Lynch loves him some Skittles. I have to admit, I like Skittles too. I don't eat them very often, but when I do pop a Skittle or two in my mouth... I like them. They're like Starburst with candy coating. And I've always loved Starburst. So Operation Gotham Shield, if you're living in New York or the New Jersey area, uh, just keep your eyes open. Keep your cell phone handy. It might really you know, come in to be an indispensable item. Uh, we've got Mercury retrograde. What else? The sun is in Taurus, first day. I'll tell you the best time you get a haircut. New moon in Taurus. Want to know when that is? People say I should be doing more astrology with my podcast streaming. I'll tell you what it is. Here we go. New moon in Taurus. It is six days from now. Let's see. Yep. 27th. If you want to get the best haircut ever, best haircut ever, new moon in Taurus, sun in Taurus. Uh, great day to plant, by the way, for all you people who are green thumbing it out there, helping keep our planet alive and vibrates. Uh, Thursday, the 27th. And even Friday the 28th, put your plants in the ground, put your seeds in the ground. That's the time. That is the time to do it. Optimal time. And let's see what else we got that day. Uh, Venus at 29. Oh, it's at the 29th degree of uh, Pisces. Oh, it's Mercury retrograde. It's been weird. Very strange. I have to deal with the check engine light in my car. Wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a Mercury retrograde without that, would it? Uh, what else do we have going on that day? We've got uh, Mars and Gemini. That's the tricky Mars. And, and then we're in that that weird May period. You know, when we've got uh, Mars climbing up on Trump's Uranus. Uh, let's see, when is that... Uh, it's at 17. That's where his Uranus is. That's May. May 17th. That's the Mars Uranus conjunction in Trump's chart. And I think at the same and I think what's his name? McMaster has his natal Mars conjunct Trump's Uranus. So it's close. So it's gonna be McMaster's Mars return. So if there's going to be something that's going to go off, it's that May corridor from the 1st through the 18th. Now, according to the Operation Gotham Shield, uh, that goes until, was that again? Is it the 5th? Let me just hold on. Yeah, May 5th. So what's happening on, it's happening on May Day. Let's check that out. Venus is at 1 Aries on May Day. 
Mars, 6 Gemini, Moon in Cancer, Mercury still retrograde to his direct on the 4th. Sun in Taurus, what do we have here? We've got uh, Jupiter still retro in Libra, Saturn's retro, uh, still in 27, long time in 27. In Sagittarius, Uranus, 25 Aries. Uh, okay, it is the final degree uh, of the true node. In Virgo, it goes into Leo on the 10th, and that true node is going to be kicking right on to Donald Trump's ascendant. How about that? You ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, Black Moon Lilith is cruising along in Sagittarius, the dark side of truth. We notice that uh, a lot of the wiki gates, the wiki gate, uh, pizza gate, pedo gate stuff, getting shoved aside. The more we talk about global conflict, the global theater, that stuff just gets pushed away. It's not interesting. All right, boys and girls, I think that's about it. It's about as much information that you can pump out of me today. So I want you to. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the stillness. The calm. Can you feel it right now? There's a calm. There's a kind of a peace right now. But it's the calm. Calm before the storm. Collect yourself. Collect yourself. Bring your atoms into coherence. And enjoy the weekend. Taurus is here. The, the intense, activated energy of Aries downshifts a little bit. Take your time. Enjoy your meals. Savor them. Appreciate what you have in your life. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to be appreciative. You know, I have a client. It was uh, her birthday today. I wished her a happy birthday. And she said, oh, thanks. I'm not really into that. Every day is my birthday. Every day I get up and I'm grateful to be alive. And that's what I want to leave you with. Leave you with. To be grateful. To be alive. And I'm telling you right now, if you have a good back, be grateful for that too. This is Robert Phoenix. You've been listening to the Friday Forecast. And... You know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real. Your heart to stay open to what's possible. Have a fantastic weekend.